Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Leah Himes. I'm the executive director of the Charleston Hub. And today's webcast is eBooks More Than a Book. And we are going to be talking about um, and with the guest editor and authors of our upcoming April issue. So we have um, a couple of just quick brief announcements uh, before we get started. The April issue will be in your inboxes before the end of the week, along with the recording of this session. Um, let's see here. The session is being recorded. <laughs> um, and as I said, the link will be sent out very shortly to everybody who's registered. Uh, we are going to be saving all questions to the end. We have a lot of really wonderful presentations, a lot of good information, um, and they'll be presenting rather quickly back to back. But if you have a question during a presentation, you can use the Q&A button. Um, it should be at the bottom of your screen, and you can submit that question as soon as you think of it so that you don't have to remember later on. Um, and we um, also have the attendee chat. So if you want to say a quick hello in the attendee chat, say your name, where you're from, where you're joining us uh, from, we can say hello to each other that way um, and say welcome. Uh, we're also going to have a very brief attendee evaluation. Once this session, when the window closes, you'll be redirected to a very short, like three question evaluation. Um, but that's really helpful for us to get uh, your feedback to improve for the next time. So we appreciate it if you could just fill that out. Uh, our speakers today, we have a really fantastic lineup. Like I said, uh, we're going to get started with uh, Dan Wong, who is our guest editor and moderator from Lehigh University Libraries. We also have Alan Jones from the New School, Lee Kinch Pedrosa and Travis Wall from Pressbooks. Charles Watkinson, University of Michigan and Michigan Publishing, and John Walensky from Stanford University and the Open Monograph Project. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Dan. Thank you so much. Take it away, Dan. Oh, good morning, everyone. My name is Daniel Huang. I am the Resource Acquisitions Manager from Lehigh University, and it's my pleasure to present to you the special issue of Against the Grain. Uh, the theme of this issue is called the stalemate. It's something we've all, as acquisitions people, kind of wonder at some point is, is an ebook just a book? And has it become a very stagnant technology where nothing new has interest, as interesting as that has happened with it? Or is it a situation where this will never improve beyond becoming just, just another copy of the print book? Because we all know if you want another bigger print book set up, we could just buy 20 copies of it as, as, as a physical item. Or as an ebook, does it do anything other than make people mad? All of these things are very important questions for Charleston conference attendees every year. So one of the first most important things about ebooks and books is being transparent to the client, to the patron. So first up, we have Mr. Alan Jones here to talk about the whole concept of transparency and tracking with patient requests. Hey everyone, good morning. Um, my name is Alan Jones. I'm the director for the Digital Library and Technical Services at the New School. My article was on the concept of interoperability and specifically around um, thinking about different types of uh, programs that we're working with at the New School. One of the um, one of the things that I'm deeply involved in is concepts in uh, controlled digital lending, um, as well as programs related to uh, um, ebook ILL. Um, and what my project basically uh, focuses on is thinking about more than just the ebook, particularly when there's human mediation involved in some of the transaction, the request and supply transactions, that we not just think about the content of the ebook, but we actually think about a lot of the additional support services that are involved. Things like status, asking the question of where my stuff is. Um, so uh, many times we think of an ebook as instant gratification. I click on a link, and in that particular, uh, um, in that particular transaction, I should be able to open it. I think we're actually at a pretty existential moment here when we start to think about licenses for ebooks as shareable between institutions. So 
one of the one of the uh, objects of the ProQuest pilot that we've been doing with interlibrary lending has been rather than thinking about a, a license as something that's institutionally confined, can we actually think about this in terms of sharing? And this has actually brought up a number of of human mediated steps that, it, because the issue isn't necessarily an immediate. I click on a link and I open the content the way that, that Dan was talking about or a facsimile, um, there may be issues in terms of status that have to be tracked. So one of the things that we've been building at the new school is a, a common status uh, um, application that allows for the tracking of some of this. So if I can just share my screen for a second. So what we've done or what you're gonna see here as a prototype is not only getting active requests for, from our ILS, but actually getting requests from Iliad as well within the request application. So Primo is a fairly customizable uh, uh, discovery service. So we've actually been able to track different types of uh, statuses of eBooks as well as book chapters and downloads and integrate that within the discovery service. So here we have an overview of what some of those transactions are, and this will actually take you to um, an integrated situation where you have both the ILS transactions as well as your Iliad transactions all within a request tab. The, the point of this is, is that many of the support services are frequently siloed in the individual platforms, whether they be eBook Central or whatever, there's a personalized uh, my, my stuff space for that particular vendor slot. What I'm asking us to imagine within the article is actually having a common standard or a common framework so that we can actually exchange the statuses of all of these requests into a common uh, shopping cart or application so that students or patrons would be able to go to the same place um, to, to look at the status of all of their requests within a single uh, place. So um, with that, uh, one of the things that's an outcome of some of the research that I've been doing is putting together a nicer work item um, on the actual communication between the vendor and this particular application. Currently, this is accomplished because we store all of these transactions in Iliad, but the question is if we didn't use Iliad or we used some other platform, what would that look like? Um, this gets particularly uh, more complicated the more uh, the more or different borrowing networks that you start to have an institution participate in. So, for example, if you use Borrow Direct, if you use Easy Borrow, if you use Reshare, if you use Rapid ILL, you can already start to see a constellation or clustering of these types of lending services, um, and. One of the questions that frustrates me at a circulation desk is the question, well, where did you request that? Where you request it will, will dictate where the status of something is actually, uh, where you can look up the status of a particular transaction, but that's just not the way that our patrons think within an Amazon-based world. So the plea here when thinking about more than just the ebook is, to also think about the support services, the requesting and supply services that are needed in order to make this, uh, in order to make this experience a transparent and uh, a rewarding experience for our patrons. So, with that, I just want to turn this back over to Dan. Thanks, Alan, for that wonderful presentation about transparency and tracking to the user. I'd like to call your attention to the seemingly mundane ebook about cats, literally the first search result for cats when I searched for cats in our library catalog. And I'm, dis I'm disappointed they didn't go with Persians. So this is just a facsimile of the of the ebook it, it, itself. Look at it. It just has it's just like it's a flat PDF, it even says it's printed on recycled paper. It's a literal facsimile. What if we were able to make resources, ebooks, that were better than just a facsimile of the print. What if open educational resources were in fact able to be more advanced than anything a print textbook could actually accomplish? What if it embedded things like quizzes and media? 
And how can we as acquisitions librarians support that kind of initiative? So let's talk to Lee Kent Pedrosa and Travis Wall from Pressbooks about that very technology. So my name is uh, Lee Kinch Pedrosa, and uh, I'm presenting today along with my co-author, Travis Wall. Um, together, we wrote uh, the article for the forthcoming Against the Grain issue, Pressbooks Reflects on uh, a Growing Movement and How Librarians Can Move OER Forward. Um, so Travis and I both work for Pressbooks, um, which is a software for creating and adapting open educational resources. Um, myself, I'm the head of marketing um, at Pressbooks, and before that, I was the communications and partnerships um, manager at our sister organization, um, which is a Canadian registered charity, and that is the Rebus Foundation. And Travis Wall is my colleague, and he is the Pressbooks librarian. Um, he's concerned mainly with improving and maintaining um, our directory, which is an index of all of the uh, openly licensed and public books that are created with Pressbooks. Um, he also helps connect people with really high quality OER. So um, today I'm just going to give you a, a short summary of what we talked about in our article um, and maybe hint at some parts that I think would be interesting for folks to dive a little further into. So uh, the history of Pressbooks, um, it was founded uh, on, based on a love of books and trying to make them native to the web and available to multiple people. Um, it was created by our founder and CEO, Hugh McGuire, in 2011 as an open source software project geared towards uh, small and independent presses. And he, at the time, he wasn't necessarily thinking about um, educational publishers, but there was a clear use case and signal from uh, open educational practitioners, um, at which point he brought on Steel Wagstaff, who is uh, or was a instructional technologist and librarian at the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison, and he is now our educational product manager. And together, they sort of worked uh, to refine um, our software for uh, open educational resources and to create templates that would um, make it easier to publish and share and adapt uh, those resources. So Pressbooks as a company kind of came of age alongside uh, a lot of the um, uh, hubs for OER or the leaders in OER, and some of those would be, you know, University of California, Berkeley, Michigan State University, Kwantlen Polytechnic University, Ryerson University, and um, some provincial organizations like BC Campus and eCampus Ontario that serve multiple colleges and universities with um, the technology they need to create, uh, to create OER and uh, other, you know, online learning um, technologies. Um, and through growing up, uh, alongside those organizations, we've had a vantage point uh, where we can look at multiple organizations and institutions and find the similarities, uh, find their successes and make observations about, you know, what could um, be improved and how librarians, um, how librarians have moved so much of the work forward. Um, and that's the bulk of what the article will be about. So, uh, the first and most obvious observation that needs stating and stating continually is that OER does live primarily in the library and has historically and probably will in the future. And that means a few things. Um, one being that librarians, because they interact so regularly with students, scholars, and educators, um, they're positioned to best understand the access problem from multiple perspectives. Um, it also means that OER is funded oftentimes out of the library budget. And you can you know, discern for yourselves what that actually means small budgets. Um, library publishing is also really important to the future access of, uh, to, um, of materials, so the importance of being able to create your own materials, um, and that librarians are doing a lot of the work of OER uh, as free labor, which is not necessarily sustainable and a problem that we should probably be addressing. Um, so considering those observations, um, I'd like to make a few short recommendations that we took uh, primarily from the article, but a couple more uh, that I've added as well. So um, some ways that librarians can support OER, one being that you can host introductory workshops in OER. Uh, a lot of uh, OER is an, um, a grassroots um, movement, which means that there's a lot of very dedicated people working very hard by themselves and sometimes together. But uh, in, in those kinds of situations, often what happens is we forget to keep introducing so that um, 
we can broaden the community and bring more educators uh, into the open education community in order to um, move everything forwards. Additionally, you can familiarize yourself with open referatories and repositories. Pressbooks directory is one of them. It's available on the web. It's totally free, pressbooks.directory. Um, but there are others as well to consider. So Open Education Library is one, OER Commons, Libertex, uh, Merlot, among many others. And um, having those available in LibGuides so that you know, other librarians can find them as well when looking for free resources as well as educators. Um, the other sort of interesting um, possibility that OER does allow for, because it's, uh, they're openly licensed, um, you can create what I like to call the Franken book. So there's uh, a tendency to look for straightforward replacements for expensive textbooks, but um, sometimes because OER is so because OER is so young, uh, those resources just don't um, exist yet. So uh, open licenses allow for remixing, which is a term coined, well, in this context, a term coined by David Wiley, who created the five R's of OER content. Um, which means that you can take chapters from multiple resources or media from multiple resources and present them in a resource that's tailored towards a specific context, um, like a specific classroom. And, and the beauty of that remix saying is that it lends itself to a more diverse perspectives within the, um, the course content. Um, finally, there are a lot of programs out there that can train librarians and faculty OER creators to help them create, adapt, and share OER. But additionally, there are a lot of programs that will teach you about copyright, um, fair use, uh, evaluating OER, all those, all those other topics that become part of the OER librarian's purview. Um, some of those resources uh, include uh, stuff from Spark, Creative Commons. Uh, the Rebus Foundation has a 12-week uh, textbook success program, which is like a professional development program for OER resources. There's also just a lot of ebooks out there on creating open educational resources. Um, and when I speak about those, I always like to shout out the work of Abby Elder at Iowa State. She creates a lot of um, open textbooks about open textbooks, and they're very valuable and accessible and step by step and available out there. Um, in our article, we also um, add additional recommendations for things that you know, the OER community can be advocating for, for together uh, in order to help the whole movement go forward. Uh, so one of them is of course more funding for OER, um, but the other one is um, the inclusion of open work and tenure and promotion dossiers um, to help uh, value the, the hard work that um, folks have been putting into creating OER. So to finish this short presentation, I'm actually gonna turn it over to my co-author, Travis, who's going to show off um, a particular open educational uh, resource that is an ebook um, that demonstrates the power of open licenses. So Travis. Hi everyone. So I'm just gonna share my screen here. And Now, one of the great things about OER is that it allows for all kinds of collaborative and iter iterative possibilities. So just as an example, uh, this is a book called Vital Sign Measurement Across the Lifespan. And it's aimed at students in health-related fields and it guides them through the different techniques for measuring a patient's vitals. And it was produced at Ryerson University. And this is, the, this is a page out of the second chapter. And as you can see, it's, it's a very nicely designed book. Uh, it makes a very good reference, but it's basically just a flat web book. And so some people looked at this and they said, you know, this is fantastic, but wouldn't it be great if it were more immersive and had self-assessments that students could complete right in the book? Um, so BC Campus awarded some funding uh, to this project via its H5P kitchen program. Uh, if you don't know, H5P is basically an open source framework for adding interactive elements to educational content. And BC Campus produced a second edition of the book and added 122 interactive elements. And so here's the, the second edition. And as you can see, it's, um, it's largely the same, except they've added these interactive parts at the bottom. So you've got this, this interactive video here, and it'll ask you, questions 
uh, throughout the video as it shows you the proper procedure for, uh, for taking this person's temperature. And down below, uh, it also has this, this multiple choice uh, question. Uh, so now it's just asking me how to proceed. And so it, you can see how this would be useful for every, every section of the book where it's not just showing you the video, but also kind of engaging you along the way and asking you to think about what's, what's happening here. So uh, with these kinds of features, a web book can even replace complicated courseware. And they even have case studies, uh, which I think is really interesting because it means that um, it puts you in the place of the healthcare practitioner. It's sort of like a choose your own adventure almost where you get to, um, to ask questions and make judgments about, about the patient. And you know, from that, you really get, get a sense of what it might be like in that position. So this kind of iteration where one group is building upon another group's work is really exciting because it means that you can have educational resources that are more than any one institution would have developed on their own. So I can think of other examples where, you know, for instance, there's a book created in the US and then it's adapted for uh, an Australian curriculum and then more content is added to it. So you can see that with every iteration, these web books grow into something even more uh, immersive and engaging and even relevant to a local audience. Okay, and with that, I'll pass it back to you. Great, I think that's all from uh, the Pressbooks folks. Um, but just to say that I think all of the resources that Travis and I mentioned, including that vital science measurement book um, are referenced in the forthcoming Against the Grain um, article as well. So if you're looking for those, they're there. Thank you to Lee and Travis for that excellent presentation on OER. Next up, we have Charles Watkinson from who is here to present about scholarly communications through the Fulcrum platform. Uh, one of the most interesting things to me about this whole set of articles in, in this issue is that if we wanted to make the ebook more than just a facsimile of the, the print version of, of it, how could we do that? What would that look like? How do we elevate the ebook so that it is taking advantage of the most of its format? If it's digital and it's born digital and it's born online, what would people expect to see? What kind of advantages would the medium give to making a book? On to you, Charles. Thank you very much, Dan. And uh, it's a real honor and pleasure to be here. So I'm Charles Watkinson. I'm director of University of Michigan Press, uh, but I'm also associate university librarian for publishing at University of Michigan. Um, and I'm gonna share some uh, links related to uh, my my uh, article in Against the Grain um, in the chat here. Um, I'm uh, really writing about um, a particular sort of uh, cognitive dissonance, as it were, that um, I think those of us who are based on university campuses particularly see. And that is the contrast between the ebooks that we see in the major platforms and the the flatness of those and the incredibly active works of digital scholarship that are being produced on our campuses. And if um, uh, you know you're like uh, you're you're like me. I mean, it's really interesting to see uh, the work, for example, of groups like uh, the Humanities Collaboratory um, at the University of Michigan, and just see how all of these scholars. Um, sort of scholars of the book are so actively engaged in digital scholarship in their own work. And I think there's a real, uh, really interesting mismatch in our experiences of the books that we license and the sorts of work that our faculty are doing. So what I focus on in my article is some of the platforms that have emerged uh, to actually really support faculty members who don't necessarily want to do a website, but want to do a book-like thing, which is amplified in its um, abilities to support digital scholarship. And I particularly talk in my presentation 
uh, in my uh, article about a platform at the University of Michigan called Fulcrum, which is explicitly designed to support uh, these kinds of enhanced ebooks um, or amplified ebooks. And a number of publishers uh, use this platform to do that work. But I also talk about some of the other platforms, uh, such as Manifold Scholarship, um, such as Raven Space, um, uh, Pub Pub, um, uh, a bunch of platforms that really facilitate this sort of work. And I would include Pressbooks, uh, for example, in, in that group as well. So I wanted to just talk a little bit about that um, experience. And one of the things Dan asked us to do was to say anything that had sort of really struck us since we wrote the articles uh, and that we wanted to share. And this is what strikes me. So last week, I was at the Society for American Archaeology meeting um, in Chicago, and it was really nice to be around people again. Um, but what was really interesting in that uh, meeting is just to meet so many authors who will come up to university press booths and they will initially start to have a conversation about their book. And there'll be a conversation with the acquisitions editor about the book. And then the acquisitions editor will ask, very interesting, but tell me about your work. And suddenly the conversation will completely change and the author will start to talk about the nature of an archaeological project now, the masses of data that an archaeological project present, uh, de delivers, uh, 3D models, uh, GIS maps, um, uh, all of this uh, material that they really want to integrate into their narrative. They don't just want to put it in the supplemental uh, packet, they want to integrate it into their narratives and how hard that is. And suddenly, also their eyes light up and they're excited to talk rather than seeing this as a conversation about tenure and promotion and a lot of hard work. And so what's really interesting at those meetings is that every scholar who appears is a digital scholar and publishers, especially in the university press community are really stepping up now to try and accommodate their needs around uh, digital uh, materials and presenting them in a way that has all the advantages of the book. So it's credit worthy, it's stable, it's portable, but also has the advantages of the website, engaging, flexible, connected into the network. And that's really what Fulcrum, Manifold, Ravenspace, Stanford University Press Digital, PubPub, uh, the work at Brown University, th this is what this, uh, this whole um, ecosystem of platforms um, is uh, supporting. So, I mean, it's easy to talk about this in very general forms, but I just wanted to give another uh, a couple of examples. So this is a book that we have just published at University of Michigan Press. It's called Vidding a History, and it's about fan videos. And it's a project where it would be really, really hard to actually write about this without showing the videos. And so here on the Fulcrum platform, you can see that all those videos are contained uh, on the platform um, and uh, they're secured in a repository environment. They're actually part of the University of Michigan Libraries um, collections uh, now to preserve them. Um, and uh, they are integrated um, into the book. So you can read about the video, you can watch the video, um, you can annotate the video, for example. Um, this is another example of a book that really required this kind of interaction. So Soul Liberty, the Evolution, Evolution of Black Religious Politics in Post-Emancipation Virginia. This is from University of North Carolina Press. It's also on the Fulcrum platform. And here the author was uh, looking at uh, maps and her scholarship was all uh, brought in through a kind of a map type of environment. Um, and it was really a geographical analysis. So she really needed to be able to show the maps um, in her work. So here in Fulcrum, you can open the interactive map. And uh, I will say that these are all open source uh, systems as well. So this is an open source viewer and you can uh, turn on different layers uh, to see uh, you know, the behavior of the electorate. Um, in this particular case. 
So this is really enabling a scholar to actually uh, write and publish in the way that she really wants to, not feeling restricted by the, um, the affordances of what is out there. And then here's another example. So here's an archaeological project. This is on the ACLS Humanities eBook collection, which is hosted on Fulcrum. Um, and uh, this is a, an archaeological project. And just look at the number of materials in this repository. Uh, so there are 2,389 um, uh, images and maps and things like that, uh, which can all be integrated into the publication. And of course, previously, these would have been dumped in a supplemental uh, data set or probably left on somebody's computer um, and uh, it would have gone bad, as it were, that whole data set. So anyhow, so that's uh, uh, an illustration of some of the things happening um, on these platforms. But I just wanted to say one last thing, which is I think one of the things that's become particularly concerning as we think about all of this work is um, to be a digital scholar, one really needs a lot of support and so what happens, are we moving into a kind of a two tier system where if you're at a major university or if you have a, a, a library that's able to support digital scholarship, you will be able to publish this work. And if you're not, you won't. And I think that's a real concern that kind of digital divide from authorship. And this is something that uh, the American Council of Learning Society's Commission on Fostering and Sustaining Diverse Digital Scholarship has really, um, really sort of uh, attuned me to, really made me think about a lot. And I think one of the things that we really need to think about then is, uh, you know, many of these works are open access, for example. Um, so how can we create an environment where scholars who can't afford to publish this type of work um, are able to do so? Um, and this is where um, the, uh, the, uh, projects that um, some of the university presses in particular are working on uh, MIT's direct to open model, for example, uh, the opening the future model. These um, projects that are funded by institutional collaboration, uh, a lot of them are library based um, purchasing models or subscribe to open models. Uh, this is where they become very, very important and interlinked with digital scholarship. So because they enable these platforms to publish digital scholarship from authors who don't have the resources uh, to get a lot of support to do that work. Um, at University of Michigan, we have the University of Michigan Press ebook collection on Fulcrum, and we have this fund to mission program, which has um, a, a large number of uh, library supporters at this time, um, uh, very much like the MIT program. And this is enabling us to do books like Vidding, which is actually written by an author at a very small college, for example. And then another model there is uh, Lever Press, uh, which is funded by over 50 liberal arts colleges and never charges any author uh, a fee. So I think these two things really go together. So, I'm really excited to be here. That's what my article is about. Um, I, uh, I, I, I think the digital scholarship and the book can live together happily, and I'm excited in the future of the book. So thank you very much. Many thanks to Charles for that part of the presentation. Uh, and Mr. Walensky has generously given a presentation today about the Open Monograph Press platform. So it's one thing to just create an ebook that's better than a print book. What about the whole editorial process? What about, about the process of making a press? What if, in his words, a, a tarball could be given to every university in the world so they could make their own press? What if that process was simpler than we thought it to be? Um, I'm John Walensky, as been said, and I'm at Stanford University, but uh, 22 or so years ago, I started the Public Knowledge Project, and I'm here to talk about where it comes in on the ebook question, because the Public Knowledge Project was uh, originally about journals, about open access to journals, um, and we've had some success with the project um, in terms of journals. Open Journal Systems was our first software. 
Um, and I come belatedly to the book. In fact, it was an odd thing for me to realize that our success with open journal systems and the general movement in terms of technology and digitization was so focused on the journal that we were putting the book at risk. Um, and as someone who has grown up and continues to be a person of the book, um, I thought this was odd and perhaps wrong. Um, in terms of open journal systems, uh, what it meant was we developed an open source software platform for journal publishing, uh, and it was distributed freely and it was taken up um, by a great number of what we now call diamond journals. Um, and there are about 32,000 journals around the world, diamond largely, a few are charging author fees and things like that. but. Um, they are largely open and free. And we thought this is a good idea that might be something the book could begin to pursue, or that is those interested in publishing. So we developed Open Monograph Press as a platform, very consistent with Charles's point about platforms. Um, and we developed it in a way that could be freely distributed. That is that it was a publishing house in a box, well, in a file, um, in a tar pit ball, I think it's called actually. Um, and that file would allow you to set up a platform that not only published the books, but saw through the whole process from submissions. And this is what we learned from the journals, uh, the journal process is that you really need to provide um, editors and publishers with a complete platform um, that integrates all these different components uh, and do so in a way that enables them to offer open access by reducing their costs. They still need support, certainly, in other ways, but at least this element of publishing could be handled. So with Open Monograph Press, we had a submission process, a peer review process, an in-house peer review, or an in-house review, rather, and an external peer review. Um, we designed it so you could involve editors, authors, reviewers, designers, and indexers at all stages in the book in book production. Um, we designed it to handle monographs as well as edited volumes with multiple authors and multiple editors. Um, we have uh, it's part of the review process, not just the internal and external, but multiple rounds of external reviews. We learned everything we could about the Onyx system for metadata and books um, so that it could be plugged in. The resulting books could be placed with Amazon using this industry standard of Onyx. Um, and we have seen it used since then for creating not just books, um, but uh, documents for libraries, reading. It also includes reading contracts and permissions and everything as part of the process but it has been used for uh, special collections, historic works. It has been used for theses and other kinds of, of um, extended long texts. So the uh, Open Monograph Press then enables uh, libraries, enables publishers, enables university presses to take advantage of open source software and open infrastructure, um, to take advantage of a community of users and a community of contributors in multiple languages, Spanish, Portuguese, French, and English, among others. Um, and it enables them to uh, distribute the works in commercial and non-commercial ways, which I'll show you in, in, in a moment. But let me just give you an example of uh, how this can work in terms of the economy of books for university presses in particular. Um, the university presses have become uh, have been forced to become, or maybe they've always been, um, quite careful with their allocation of publication, that is with the, what they decide to publish because of the investment and the overhead and the personnel involved. Um, whereas uh, the university scholars are very interested in seeing a whole range of works published in terms of academic freedom and innovation and discovery. Um, and so their concern is how can we get these books out? Um, and that combination of the university's university presses in picture of um, vetting and review and authority um, combined with the innovation of faculty sometimes leaves some good projects on the side. Um, with Open Monograph Press, we've designed it in a way that the university scholars, the enthusiastic series editors, for example, um, can remain involved um, through the whole process. And in fact, a university press can decide the degree of overhead it wants to invest in any given project. If they see it will be a success in the library market, for example, they can be all in. But if they think it won't have that success, it can say to the 
uh, editors promoting it, that is the uh, series editors promoting it, or even the authors, that you'll need to see through the better part of this process in terms of review, managing the review, and in terms of peer editing, sorry, uh, proofing and copy editing, um, and even laying out the text. All of that is going to be something the press cannot handle, but will approve of the text once it passes peer review, and we'll put its label on it, if not its full engagement. That raises issues, of course, about quality perhaps, but I think there are ways to arrive at compromises in order to ensure that the scholarship flourishes. To give you a couple of examples of what this would look like, let me uh, share my screen here. Or what it does look like, I should say. This is uh, an example is uh, Language Science Press, and this is Open Monograph Press's homepage. It takes, it does some of the cataloging work um, and uh, organizes it so you can set up displays and have features of, of different sorts. Um, in terms of the works that you have, um, there are um, ways of promoting your series and other aspects of it, but essentially um, what we see is that the book uh, let's get down here. Um, uh, there's a submission process for the book um, and the typical preparation, author guidelines, copyright notices, preamble, and all those sorts of things that um, mark and automate in a sense, or at least prepare, fully prepare, I shouldn't say automate, fully prepare for um, receiving the public and having submissions made to it. Um, the resulting book, let me just choose, uh, I, did, I chose an example here. This is, um, again, Language Science Press as, as an instance of Open Monograph Press, using Open Monograph Press. This is a dictionary and grammatical sketch of, of Daguerre. Um, this is a, a Ghanese language, or a language in Africa that is spoken in Ghana. Um, this is a relatively recent book issued in uh, 21, 2021, um, and is uh, received immediate number of, considerable number of downloads, far more than it would have if it was published um, in a traditional manner in print. Um, you can see the book is available from multiple sources, um, including more than one Amazon. Um, there's even a collaborative reading site that's been set up. And again, this was done uh, by Language Science Press, but these uh, ability to add these features are part of the open source uh, elements of this. The open source software means that uh, the software is open for these developments. Um, they are shared widely and we have a community of users um, who are contributing. Um, the book itself um, is available, as I say, in various formats, but let me have a quick look at the PDF. Um, let me, uh, it has a cover, but it also has a very traditional uh, format to publication in terms of the metadata, in terms of the copyright um, and all of the uh, material that you would typically expect ISSNs, DOIs. Uh, and whatnot. Um, so it, is, it provides an opportunity then for books that might not otherwise um, be published. It allows the publishers to decide on the level of investment and overhead they wish to invest in the book. Um, it allows series editors and authors um, to become much more involved in the publishing process. Uh, and um, interesting table of contents, <laughs> alphabetical, um, and it enables uh, what I would think of um, as an intellectual or academic freedom um, to flourish um, in terms of the sharing of ideas. And in particular, I would end with this idea of the scope of ideas. One of the things that um, hit me after a while in working in journal publishing um, is that the, uh, the size of the thought, uh, to use a, a title, from Nicholas Baker um, is an important aspect and that articles have a certain size to them that limits um, the nature uh, of the thought. And we can make references to the way in which articles are decided upon as an article, um, but the scope and value of the book, uh, not just in the humanities, but in particular there um, is an important aspect. Uh, and in the digital realm, um, it is a matter, and this group and panel have done a wonderful job of celebrating it. It is a matter, it's a matter that has to be considered um, and, and supported um, and unless we otherwise put at risk uh, the, sale, the scale and size of our thought. Uh, let me leave it at that, Dan, and turn it back to you. Um, and uh, I'm hoping that your audio is working a little better, or maybe I can help if there are things you want to say. Uh, let's begin with the, the Q&A. Uh, 
Charles, uh, I saw that you answered a question in the Q&A. Can you uh, summarize a little bit of that for the audience? Yeah, uh, and I pressed <laughs> I pressed the wrong button to suggest that it had been answered live. But uh, uh, there was a an anonymous attendee who asked about the interactive maps. They seem to be hosted within Fulcrum. Are they created within the platform form or imported from elsewhere? Um, so. Uh, the, the answer is that the GIS work to create the, uh, the data for these interactive maps is created outside the platform. Um, and in fact, in the case of Soul Liberty, that was created at Virginia Commonwealth University uh, within the library who was supporting the author. Um, but uh, then that's packaged up and then it's played within Fulcrum using an open source software tool called Leaflet. Um, and I was just looking at the Leaflet website and I realized that uh, Leaf it says here Leaflet was created 11 years ago by Vladimir uh, Agafonkin, a Ukrainian citizen living in Kiev. So it's uh, really a sign of our times that uh, uh, Vladimir is now uh, fleeing, fleeing Kiev uh, um, and they've had to move the, the software source. But anyhow, but Leaflet is an open source software package. Uh, and so that uh, the file now lives within Fulcrum and is served up through Leaflet. And we also use um, a couple of other open source tools. It's an entirely open source platform built out around a lot of modular open source tools. So a Able Player for video, for example. So I hope that helps. Oh, well, it looks like there's a question from Fran Sterling about OER. Uh, uh, Travis and Lee, can you handle this one? While you're while you're doing that, I'll read the questions out uh, for the audience to hear, um, and then you and Travis can address them if that works. Um, in the early stages of creating an ebook on the use of documentary films in high school and university courses, what do you recommend for incorporating feature doc films already licensed to an ed distributor within an ebook format? Looking for recommendations on length of video within ebook, how much original media content to create, what would be the best OER tips you can offer? Yeah, so I, I think first of all, just knowing the licenses of what's of what you're allowed to do with that featured doc. Um, but uh, with I, I mean, I can only speak for Pressbooks specifically, but with Pressbooks, it should be relatively easy to embed, or it is relatively easy to embed um, audiovisual directly into the page of the book. Um, it probably is best to cut it up so that learners don't have to, you know, refer to the whole entire feature length or have specific, I know with H5P as well, you can annotate videos. Um, and uh, as Travis shared, you can have specific um, questions pertaining to specific timestamps in a video. So there's a lot of functionality that you could do there. Um, one of the interesting things that I learned once in speaking with one of our users was um, that students don't, that she said, <laughs> students will say, never take me to a second location. So as long as you can like embed it within the book that they're in, it becomes a, um, a better user experience for the students rather than having a link up to uh, another tab. That would be that would be my sort of various angles from the perspective of Pressbooks. Um, yeah. Uh, can I just add, Leah, that um, uh, I, I think uh, Lee's point about um, the rights and permissions aspects is very very important, and that uh, has a really chilling effect often on the scholars who are trying to produce these kinds of works. And I think that's uh, an area that is still very problematic. Um, it's like, is one allowed? to uh to actually um you know share these uh multimedia materials what are the rights behind those um etc and i think that's a very very challenging part of this world and this new area of scholarship thank you um alan i just saw your message about a question you can just go ahead and and give your question and uh turn on your mic and talk that's the easiest way to do it Sure. This is really a question for Charles and for John. Um, I noticed, particularly looking at um, some of the examples, uh, that some of the programming languages are actually end of life. And this kind of goes to that idea of the support of open source softwares 
in kind of you know we're creating com we're creating content in these platforms that require a certain level of care and and upkeep within the uh, um, uh, within the ecosystem. Um, how, how do you see that as a as a challenge or sustainability for some of these platforms? It, it, do you see this as um, what roles can libraries play to actually uh, support the platform as much as support the the content creation mechanism? Charles, uh, I I'm happy to jump in. Um, I mean, the, it, the, this is an ongoing issue, and and the support of the project by libraries, the public knowledge project in particular, has um, a community of libraries that support it for an ongoing development. So there's two aspects. One is that technically we need to keep up um, and we need to plan for the future. So there is a commitment there. Um, and the uh, public knowledge project is based at Simon Fraser University Library. Um, and the university is gives us a level of sustainability for the project. And I think a commitment given the size of our community. Um, but the other side is the preservation of the texts themselves of, of what is produced. Um, and that is actually more developed on the on the journal side. We have um, locks uh, technology that is designed to keep journals alive if one goes down or if there are problems in terms of, of the um, preservation. Um, and we're working with the Internet Archive as well for longer term preservation. Um, there is the very long question of the future um, that we don't have resolved, um, but the immediate one, we're working both in terms of the platform sustainability and the content. Charles, what about your side? Yeah, I think that's absolutely it, uh, John. I, um, I think uh, the role of the libraries um, uh, in supporting the uh, uh, in supporting the permanence of the content is very, very important. I think the uh, the software players that are delivering that uh, and the support of open source software in general, that's a, there's a financial uh, support question in there um, that is a little bit different from the preservation of the content. And um, I mean, two, two answers to that. One is that, uh, you know, I think this is why designing these systems in a very modular way is good because you can swap out players um if one goes defunct so that's very pragmatic also using a very standards-based approach is very good so there are standards like the triple if standard uh standard identifiers um uh, those kinds of approaches are very very good and then also thinking about how uh the platforms themselves thinking about how um the benefits that they gain trickle down so one of the commitments that fulcrum makes is to um support the software communities of those players that we um, use um, either through money. So we will pay some like hypothesis, we'll pay some money towards hypothesis or um, develop uh, developer time. And I think that kind of uh, work is, is common in our platforms. Um, and I will say one other thing, which is these enhanced eBooks actually pose a particular preservation challenge because they're a combination of content and relationships between different sorts of content. And there's some very important work happening led by New York University libraries, looking, uh, working with portico and clocks to look at how one could actually preserve the whole package, the relationships plus the content itself. And that's well worth supporting. Dan, you've posed a, a question in the chat uh, to Leah and Charles and me. Um, mm -hmm. What is the best way to get leadership behind these types of ebook uh, creation initiatives? Um, and Lee, did you wanna? start on that i'm taking dan's role on here because he's having audio sure i'd be happy to yeah um so uh, i i spoke to um a lot of people who run publishing programs um i guess in 2020 to ask this exact question and the big thing that they all said was show them a resource um when you can actually show like a good quality book and you know uh, one that includes a peer review statement an accessibility review statement and say this is an example of the hard work that people are doing um, that um, represents uh, your institution in a really excellent way. Um, when they can see that something tangible, it is um, it is uh, highly beneficial. Um, oh, I had one other thought on that, and now it's gone. Well, they can't have been that important. Charles, you can maybe come back to it, Charles. 
Yeah, uh, I think there's a um, there is an interesting a little a little bit of an interesting disconnect that I'm noticing um, in library digital scholarship uh, provision. Um, uh, I, I think a number of uh, libraries do have uh, digital scholarship services, uh, but they tend, to my mind, to be particularly focused on uh, uh, pedagogy, uh, so teaching, consultancy, um, and uh, and you know uh, experimentation um, and sort of building things. Uh, and actually, there's a little bit of a drop off of support when it comes to the commitment to the durable record of scholarship, as it were, um, and questions like preservation and uh, identifiers and all of the things that libraries care about so much when they buy content. So it's a funny little mismatch between the digital scholarship services that are working with faculty and students to create these sorts of works and the other side of the library, which is concerned with the durable record. And I think actually one of the best ways to get leadership is to actually um, interrogate inside libraries why that disconnect is happening and what can be done to help faculty bridge that kind of gap. Um, so that's that's one thought I had. Okay, I, I would go the other side, uh, Charles, in terms of the scholars and the faculty. Um, and think about leadership within, uh, we have departments uh, that become publishing houses because they have work they want to see out and they're trying to build a kind of cluster of, of intellectual interest. We have uh, small societies that are very interested in terms of publishing um, and going beyond the journal. Uh, math's an interesting area where book series are a thing. So our goal has been to enable uh, more work to flourish. It does raise the downstream sustainability questions and proper indexing and all those sorts of things. Um, but what we've also learned is that a press that, or a journal or a press that goes out of print, as it were, that stops still has a, a standing contribution um, where the preservation question comes into play, but it, it is a flourishing that has happened and is worth capturing and not discouraging because we don't have all of the plans worked out. Um, so that leadership uh, within the community and an excitement really, uh, intellectual excitement, I would call it, in terms of um, giving people an opportunity to realize their ideas in a way that sometimes seems very difficult because of the financial barriers. Um, and not, the, not that the library poses them um, in terms of the da data management or the uh, metadata issues, but it, uh, it should come, the leadership should come from uh, the people with the ideas, some leadership at least. Yeah, and I want to just to uh, endorse that. I mean, of course, I'm, I'm positionally right. I have to speak about university presses and uh, the more established publishers, but I think okay. that's a very important point, John, that the, the lowering of the barriers to entry and the, the development of these disciplinary specific, smaller publishers, for example, often disciplinary specific, especially some of the scholar-led publishers, um, uh, open book publishers, punctum, uh, groups like that, and then also all the work that you do within uh, uh, PKP to really raise uh, the opportunities for multilingual publication. And um, I mean, the global spread, I mean, our platforms, the ones I talk about are still very Anglo-American in their focus. Uh, they have nothing like the, uh, the, the reach that uh, PKP does. We just, uh, we just realized we have 56 languages. Uh, our platforms are being used to publish in 56 languages. Um, and it is, it's remarkable. And this is our community. This is not the public knowledge project. If you give them the tools, they will flourish. So I hope everyone enjoyed these presentations and thanks to all of the presenters. Perhaps libraries are not in as much of a stalemate with eBooks as we think we are. Perhaps there are so many interesting steps to be taken in the next couple of years with us not just acquiring content, but also producing content and encouraging the production of content and even advocating for making that content. One of the things, you know, growing up was that I remember my father, a math professor, saying that sometimes it's hard for professors to write a book. Sometimes it's hard for younger faculty to even publish a paper or an article. But what if libraries use all of this wonderful technology to change that? And they would said, Anyone can publish anything. We'll set up the press, 
We'll set up the formatting. We'll set up the online aspect. We'll make it open. We'll make it transparent. Everyone, everyone knows exactly where they are in this process of making books, reading books, getting books, buying books, requesting books, all of those things. It's a big shift in thinking about how we are moving from acquiring to facilitating. So I hope these presenters have all given us some interesting perspectives on where library technology is headed. Absolutely. Thanks to everyone. Thank you, Dan, Alan, Lee, Travis, Charles, John. Uh, it was a fantastic issue, and I'm looking forward to sending it out to all of you, uh, like I said, by the end of the week, along with a recording of this session. So have a wonderful day, and we'll catch you back here at the next Charleston Conference webinar. Bye, everybody.